All right, thank you. Um, again, good morning, everybody. Uh, appreciate you being here for our April installment in our understanding our wildlife, Wildlife Commission Science Informing Conservation Series. Uh, so with that, our presentation today, as you can see from the screen, is by Michael Fisk, our Eastern Aquatic Wildlife Diversity Coordinator. Uh, the title of, of his presentation is Conservation of the Carolina Mad Time. Uh, Michael, again, thank you for uh, your interest in making the presentation today. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. All right, sounds good. Um, so good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, David, for the introduction. Um, see, I'm going to try to minimize this and get it out the way. Um, so yeah, looking forward to, you know, we we had this really interesting fish, Carolina Mad Tom, in our region found in the tar and the noose basins. and nowhere else in the world. So it's, it's it's kind of a really cool opportunity to be able to work with a species like that. And um, in the Eastern region, we spend a ton of time working with Carolina Mad Times each year. And so it's gonna be nice to just be able to share some of that information with everybody today. Wanted to start out kind of taking a broader approach and like talk about just what Mad Times are. I mean, they're a really interesting uh, catfish species that found in North America and then kind of as the talk goes on kind of narrow in on on Carolina mad times and really focus on some of the work we've done there. So uh, mad times are um, you know there's 29 species found throughout North America. They're out of all the catfish they're the most diverse genus in uh, in North America and due to um, a lot of water quality issues and habitat degradation, invasive species, um, and just the um, the specific habitat requirements for mad towns, you know, roughly half of them are imperiled to some degree. Um, you can see the map to the right here that's um, showing the, the genus and the tourists, the mad towns, you know, they, they range from the east coast all the way through the Mississippi basin. Uh, from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up into uh, some some drainages in in Canada, so pretty wide ranging species or a group of species. And uh, the name Mad Tom, you know, a lot of people associate it with their their really bad sting that they can give, um, but it kind of originates in the late 1800s from Jordan, um, talking about how they. They swim away when you can counter them, like flipping over a rock and one swims away and they're just kind of swimming away crazily, like sporadically and just kind of like a mad time. So um, kind of interesting uh, little fact there. So what what makes mad times different than other catfish species we have in North in uh, in North Carolina and elsewhere? Um, typically, they're they're really small compared to other species. They're usually, you know, only a couple of inches long. A lot of times when people find them, they think they're just finding baby catfish. Um, their their tails are broadly rounded and truncate or truncate, and the adipose fin, um, which all catfish have adipose fin, kind of towards the back um, behind the dorsal fin. Their adipose fin is really broad and connected and comes all the way down and connects to the caudal fin, their tail fin. And the the genus name uh, Naturus actually means it kind of roughly translates to back tail or like tail on the back. So kind of the way it connects all the way around. Um, but yeah, just the size when people find them, they think they're just little baby catfish. And, uh, you know, it's the kind of thing that when you're fishing, you're not going to catch a cat, uh, a little tiny mad tom. <clears throat> So within within the uh, mad toms, you know, there's a the subgenus Rabida. Rabidae, um, that's where the Carolina Mad Time fits in. Um, it's the largest subgenus and most species out of all of the Mad Times. You know, 18 species there, and they're they're typified by you know these really boldly patterned you know black and yellows. They have a lot of saddle markings on their back and speckles on their side. Where compared to other Mad Time species, are are typically kind of more more just typical catfish colors where they're really drab and olive and uh, not much coloration there. They also have a very uh, a curved pectoral spine, so the spines on the side, um, they're curved and they have a lot of uh, serrae or 
uh, basically small saw like spikes, which I have some pictures of it here in a second. I'll show you and, and, and they're typically you know, short, stout body forms. Um, there's a picture here of Carolina Mad Time, which really exemplifies like, you know, all of those characteristics of this subgenus. And you can see, you know, here's a mad a Carolina Mad Tom, you know, the, the bold the color patterns and everything um, really help it to be camouflaged, to avoid predators, but also to be able to ambush prey uh, when it needs to. So getting back to, you know, uh, Mad Tom Sting. So that's kind of you know, what most people think of when they think of Mad Toms is if, if you're aware of them, just being stung by them. Um, the Mad Toms, they have, um, you know, venom in uh, to, to different degrees in their pectoral and dorsal spines. And it's been studied a little bit, you know, it's when you get stung, it's typically, you know, like a bee sting and there's, you know, a whole spectrum of reactions there where some people it doesn't bother them at all and others it, it can be a severe reaction. Um, and there's for the mad times, there's basically four different combinations you have there. Um, so you have this, you know, the first combination is just a smooth spine. So this middle picture here just showing the pectoral spine and no venom, which is this combination is actually pretty rare because almost all of them do have some some level of venom. Um, the second combination is that same smooth spine with venom, um, and typically the the venom glands kind of run along the shaft of the spine here or down at the base. Uh, the third combination is this picture down below where you have a, a serrated spine. You can see the spikes coming off on the, the anterior, the front side, and then the posterior, the back side here. Um, and the, the venom gland kind of runs along the shaft of the spine there. And then the fourth combination is what uh, the Carolina Mad Tom has. It's got, you know, these, these posterior serrations that have vi venom glands along the shaft and in between these uh, the serrations on the posterior side. So you can imagine getting getting stuck by a Mad Tom. You, you'd much rather be stuck by, you know, this kind of smooth shaft, uh, smooth spine here, um, the ones that Carolina Mad Times and other um, Mad Times with this type of spine, you know, it just leaves a much bigger wound and just having the the venom along the shaft of the spine and in between these serrations just gives you much more in, uh, chances to be encountered by it. And so much just a, a stronger, more intense uh, sting. And um, so for the Carolina Mad Tom, you know, their species name is Furiosus, which translates to, you know, mad or raging. And they're considered the, uh, you know, kind of the most potent out of all the, the Mad Toms as far as their sting goes. So. so in this, in this subgenus, in the Rabida subgenus, you know, they're, they're typically, um, within the southeast up into the Midwest a little bit in the northeast. Um, you know, the here's again that same map showing the Naturis uh, genus, the Mad Toms throughout uh, the United States or North America. And um, the numbers represent how many um, Mad Toms are in each, each state. So you can see in Tennessee, Missouri, um, Arkansas and Alabama, these are kind of hot spots for diversity for these mad toms. Um, you know, some of the most widespread species are the brindled mad tom and the mountain mad tom, which their ranges go from, you know, basically the Gulf of Mexico up into Canada. Um, but we do have a lot of species that are, you know, have much more narrow ranges and are only found in, in one state. Um, you know, Carolina mad tom, Obviously, what we're talking about today, there's a Smoky Mad Tom in Tennessee, the Black River Mad Tom in Missouri, Cato Mad Tom in Arkansas, and then the Scioto Mad Tom, which is from Ohio, but it's uh, it's based on some uh, very few collections in the 40s and 50s and really hasn't been seen since then, so uh, it's considered con extinct. Um, there's a, a lot of, you know, different degrees of uh, imperilment and state listings with all of these species and a fair amount of uh, these species are federally listed as well. Um, 
we have uh, three, three of these mad toms are federally endangered. Four of them are listed as threatened with one proposed, and then two of them are petitioned. So they will go through this review process at some point. So roughly half of the, the this subgenus here, Rabidae, is, uh, you know, federally listed. So it's a, a very uh, imperiled group of fish. Um, and then the Carolina mad tom are, is the only uh, species on the Atlantic slope. So we have, you know, there's other mad toms in Virginia and Georgia, but they're all, those ranges are on the western side of the continental divide and flow into the interior basin. And so it's kind of neat to have use the one isolated um, Atlantic slope species here in North Carolina. <clears throat> So then kind of narrowing into North Carolina and the, the mad time diversity we have here, um, we've got seven different species um, kind of starting on the left side of the slide. The mountain mad time, stone cat and the orange fin mad time are all. Um, uh, their ranges extend um, mostly outside of North Carolina. You know, the mountain mad time and stone cat are um, interior basin species, so we just get kind of a fringe of their distribution. The orange fin mad time is found in the upper Roanoke drainage in um, in uh, northern North Carolina. It goes into Virginia. Uh, obviously, the Carolina mad time there is in the noose and the tar in the central part of our state. And the um, margin mad time is probably our most widespread species from the coastal plain through the Piedmont all the way to the foothills. Um, <clears throat> let's see, then we have tadpole mad time, which is more of a, a coastal plain species. And then our broadtail mad time, which is a pretty rare, um, rare catfish that has a small fragmented, small fragmented populations in a couple of different drainages in uh, the southeastern part of the state going down into South Carolina. So again, you know, the Carolina mad time is the only one that's federally endangered, but we do have a lot of state listed species as well here. And I want to just point out to um, a lot of the pictures that are photographs that I'm using are from NC Fishes. Uh, website. It's a website developed um, by a lot of uh, the Commission's colleagues and there's actually some staff from the Commission and the Museum of Natural Sciences and uh, Division of Marine Fisheries. A lot of different groups have kind of pulled together. The, the individuals that run it um, have created a really, really good resource. Um, I advise folks that if you haven't checked it out to check it out and um, it's got a lot of information on freshwater fish, saltwater fish and also kind of dig into uh, crustaceans and shrimp and stuff like that. So it's a really neat website and I appreciate all their really, their awesome photographs because I, I don't have, my photographs are horrible compared to theirs. So I appreciate them letting me use them. <clears throat> so looking at the, uh, just kind of the size, you know, I kind of talked about that a little bit of mad times in general. You know, they're typically, you know, only a couple of inches, like the biggest Carolina mad time is six, seven inches, maybe um, compared to our bullheads in the state, which, you know, get roughly, you know, give or take a, a foot or so. Um, then our largest native catfish, the white catfish is uh, they'll get, uh, you know, up around 20 inches or so and, and um, you know, maybe up to eight, 10 pounds or so. And that those are compare those with the two um, introduced species, flathead catfish and blue catfish that, you know, they, they reach sizes you know, over three feet long and the blue cats get, you know, over a hundred pounds and flatheads get, you know, 70, 80 pounds in North Carolina. So just a, most people are, are fishing for blues and flatheads and channels which aren't on here but we do have uh you know the white cats and bullheads that that uh, people like to fish for too and you're just hardly ever going to catch a mad time uh fishing for catfish all right so some some uh, the life history of the species or just the group again um for mad times 
So they typically mature anywhere from age one to four. For Carolina mad times, they're maturing at age two. And they're short-lived species. They, you know, they live, you know, anywhere from three to nine years. For Carolina mad times, it's probably three, four, five years, uh, with some exceptions there. Their their diet, they're pretty opportunistic. Um, they mainly feed on benthic invertebrates, and you know some of the larger mad times will get small crustaceans and fishes. And they're mainly active at night, so they really um, one of the the necessities for these these mad times is that they need cover to hide under. Uh, they need areas where they can get underneath the interstitial space of rocks and woody debris and shells and even bottles and cans and stuff to where they can get in and hide through the day and able to um, you know kind of wait out the day and then come out at night to feed. <clears throat> so they're mainly active at night. And that's a lot of the folks that uh, you know do a lot of work with mad times. They'll actually in some places that's when they do their their sampling is out at night. So just they have a lot more success. All right, so that's kind of some background information on mad times in general um, in the state and then elsewhere. And now kind of dial in and really talk more about Carolina mad times. So the Carolina mad times, you know, they prefer these medium to large streams and rivers with moderate gradient. So they need they they prefer these flowing waters and areas with uh, silt free sand, gravel and cobble. And again, kind of talking about the cover, the cover is very important, not only for Carolina mad times, but all mad times just for for spawning and just uh, predator avoidance throughout the entire year. So the historical occurrence for Carolina mad times, you know, um, again, they're in the tar in the new basins. And uh, these these polygons here, colored polygons represent smaller watersheds. Uh, within each of these basins and the darker green represents more recent collections. So within the last five years and then as the, the colors kind of fade, it uh, shows like more historical collections. So these these lighter greens that are down in the coastal plain um, and throughout the new Salat are uh, collections from over 20 years ago. So the, the big big picture here or the take home message from this is that, you know, Carolina mad times are are, oper are occupying just a fraction of of their historical habitat. You know, they don't really um, occupy any of these coastal plain habitats anymore. And really the upper noose is kind of their stronghold. <clears throat> so there's been a fair amount of work done on the uh, Carolina mad times, like going back to the 80s where Burr uh, did a lot of the life history work and uh, did a lot of distribution abundance and laid down the groundwork for, you know, kind of baseline data for this species moving forward. Um, some of our staff, Chris Wood and Rob Nichols, um, have, you know, back in 2011, you know, kind of updated some of Burr's work and revisited some of the sites he went to and found that the, the, the abundance of Carolina mad times was going down and just the range was becoming more restricted. So it really documented, uh, you know, um, the declining numbers of the species. We've also had, you know, multiple graduate students working out at NC State with this species. Um, working for uh, Tom Kwok, uh, Steve Midway back in 2008, did a lot of habitat suitability work and uh, tested out using, you know, these artificial cover or mad Tom motels is what he, he kind of coined them to see how they would use them if you put them out. Um, you know, the Carolina mad times, a lot of times you'll find them in just like an old knee high bottle out there in the creek. Um, and they don't mind what it is. They'll get up underneath it and hide as long as there's good interstitial space there for them to hide into. And so he found that you could put these artificial covers out and uh, actually detect more mad times using these. And then later on, Bobby Cope kind of picked up on a lot of that work that Midway had started and got into more detection and then started looking into the genetics of the species as well. So for us, you know, outside of research projects and stuff, you know, 
our typical you know monitoring protocol for them is to snorkel um you know a lot of the historical collections and stuff were from rote known and you can get them electrofishing some but snorkeling is the most efficient way to collect uh the mad times and keeping them alive and it's it's very the way we do it is very low tech it, it's um you know get in and kind of start working your way upstream and slowly just picking up rocks uh, woody debris, you know, bottles, and just looking underneath them, looking inside of them, you know, pouring the contents of a bottle out into a f aquarium net, and working our way upstream and and looking for these mad times. And they're um, they're I don't know if it's because of their their ca camouflage, they rely on their camouflage, or if they just you know with the venom venom spines, they just think they're kind of big and bad, but. A lot of times when you flip over a rock and there's a Carolina mad time there, they don't swim away. They stay right there. And um, so it makes it really easy. For, as long as you're nice and slow, you can just take an aquarium net and put over top of them and, and you got a Carolina mad time. So it's a, a really simple but efficient way of collecting them. And we also, uh, with, uh, with the, the mad time motels in this picture here just shows uh, what Steve Midway started. We, we put these out periodically and they're, they're really useful too. the mad times go inside of them and we can come and check them and, and uh, collect them that way as well. <clears throat> so with, you know, kind of this, you know, decades long um, declining trend in the species, you know, it, the, the the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service underwent the species status assessment for them and last year listed the species as endangered. With that came 257 miles of critical habitat. And, and the biggest reasons for decline, um, a lot of it's due to you know, urbanization and, and kind of the, the blowback from that where you just get reduced water quality, habitat degradation, um, and then later on, you know, more recently has been uh, the range expansion of the invasive flathead catfish, which uh, will eat the eat the, the Carolina mad times. So here I have a map showing, um, you know, again, that heat map of the, the Carolina mad times, the kind of more recent occupancy in these darker greens and shows the collections of flathead catfish. <clears throat> and what we found is that when we're out snorkeling and we when we find flathead catfish co-occurring, they show up in a reach where Carolina mad times are, the flathead, the Carolina mad times disappear pretty quickly after that in the next couple of years. Um, you know, in, in the noose here, the, the green polygons here, where in the Little River and in Contentnia Creek, you know, we've collected them back in 2000. And we've collected Carolina mad times in 2018, but since then, you know, we've done a ton of work in both of these watersheds and have not found them again. And it's it's very likely that they're they're extirpated from the noose basin right now. Um, it's a you can see kind of largely up here in the stronghold for Carolina mad times in the upper tar. The flatheads have not pushed that far upstream yet, so. And it, some of the, you know, tools that we have to, there's not a whole lot we can do about flat egg catfish at this point, um, but anything to slow them down helps. Um, you know, for decades, we've been in this mindset of removing dams uh, because of all the negative impacts that dams have on you know, habitat alteration, flow, flow alteration, um, and preventing mig preventing migratory uh, pathways for species. But uh, when you consider an invasive species like the flathead catfish, they actually act as barriers um, and can keep them out of areas that that are important for you know, species like the Carolina mad time. So in th these green dots here represent some dams in the upper tar that, you know, Claire Carolina mad times are upstream of these dams and the flatheads have not pushed up also to all of them and can't get past them right now. So um, it just really kind of complicates, you know, dam removal even more than what it already was. But um, 
uh, this kind of a a shining light and it, it one positive from a dam like that from these old kind of relic you know, historic dams that have been in for a long time and, and they can there's still some good from them so so with you know with all kind of the declines in the species um you know the issues that we've had in the news population and um the species being listed you know we we started working with um conservation fisheries out of knoxville tennessee um, they're an organization that specializes in propagating rare and imperiled fish species and so we wanted to reach out to them start working with them to with two main goals in, in hand to you know have an arc population for carolina mad times um, and also to start working on propagation techniques to where hopefully we can start reintroducing or augmenting populations uh, into suitable habitats. And you know, conservation fisheries, this is another you know, good website if you haven't visited before. They're a great organization that you can see there's a whole list of other mad tom species that they work with. Uh, they even got t-shirts for yellow thin mad tom, which is pretty cool. Um, they have you know, well over 50 species that they do um, and just have a wealth of knowledge of, you know, propagating these species for, for several decades now. So for us, you know, as you know, our staff, you know, our, our, our role in this partnership is, you know, basically to provide the brood stock so they can, they can work their magic at their hatchery and uh, try to spawn these critters. Um, so again, you know, our, our, what we were doing is, you know, going out basically like our, the survey techniques I was talking about before, you know, collecting, just snorkeling, collecting uh, males and females, and then checking the Mad Tom motels for, for individuals in there, and also looking for nests. If we found a nest uh, of eggs, we would collect the eggs and bring those back in too. And so we've been doing this, you know, since 2018. Um, kind of our current running inventory at CFI is 32 broodstock. We've got um, all but two of those have come out of uh, the noose. And we've also been able to collect two nests and, and get those uh, get all of those eggs up to uh, CFI as well. <clears throat> and our broodstocks, broodstock collections have mainly been um, in the tar in Sandy and Swift Creek and then the Fishing Creek watershed, which includes Little Fishing Creek. And we have gotten, you know, as I showed, uh, you know, one male from Contentnia Creek and then one male from L the Little River. Um, but uh, those have been the only two collections we've made in the in the news over the last, uh, you know, five years or so with uh, with a ton of effort in both of those those systems. And at CFI, you know, they, they've got tanks set up to where they try to recreate, you know, some of that physical habitat that the species needs to thrive. So creating some of that interstitial space with cover and places for them to hide. <clears throat> so some of the some of the issues that we ran into first, kind of early on, is that we were only really finding male Carolina mad times. And um, so it kind of the first couple of years was really just, you know, CFI holding individuals and kind of waiting out and hoping that we would get some females. We did bring in a nest in 2018. And um, from that nest, some of the, the offspring, you know, grew up and matured and they were females. And in 2020, they were able to use the females out of that nest, uh, pair them up with other males and had had limited success in 2020. Um, we're able to pair individuals up and they spawn. They did have kind of some water quality issues at the hatchery in the facility that um, kind of impeded some of the work and uh, ended up, you know, 2020 production was, you know, just a handful of individuals. And then starting in, 20, in 2021, um, we were able to catch some big gravid females um, and then a lot with those along with the females and males they already had and they kind of cleared up some of the water quality issues and refined some of their techniques they had a lot more success in 2021 and really it's kind of kind of jump-started this whole 
whole, whole production they've had with the uh, Carolina Mad Tums. So in, in 2021, they raised through roughly 400 individuals. And so our goals were to release most of those if we could. Um, CFI was hoping to, they wanted to hold on to around 50 or so that those were ones that uh, spawn the they were like the last spawners and uh, they were kind of the runts of the group and they thought that those would benefit uh, staying in the hatchery one over throughout the winter to get a little bit bigger before we released them um, so we took you know some of those individuals you know roughly 150 or so um, and uh, sent out of those, they kept 50 and then 100 went to uh, our Conservation Aquaculture Center in Marion just to kind of split things up and give more room for uh, CFI. And so we've had these individuals and we're we're looking to uh, release these in in the spring in the next couple of weeks. And so for, for us to release the Carolina Mad Times, you know, we had to get approval through our, our Habitat Non-Game and Endangered Species uh, uh, Committee for in our commission, and then also through our non-game, through the Non-Game Wildlife Advisory Committee in uh, in the state. And so we really got authorization to, to release them in the upper tar and, to, you know, sandy, swift, fishing, um, and we really wanted to, you know, once we had individuals, put them back into like areas where we we thought they would be very successful. So where the population is strong to make sure that we can kind of ground truth this thing and make sure that uh, we get this program running running in the right direction, as opposed to you know start releasing them into areas that have where the mad times have di disappeared, and just to try to see what would happen. So we really wanted to give them a good good start to see how to make them successful. And so last November, we were able to release you know, 118 into Fishing Creek and uh, 148 into Sandy Creek. Um, and so you could see in the picture, we, we ended up having, um, you know, partners from US Fish and Wildlife come out and help out and uh, um, Missy McGall is able to come out and get some great pictures of us doing it. Uh, you can see in the picture here the um, the tags uh, they have uh, visible implant elastomer tags so we can track you know what cohort they are. Um, we're going to be out in the next couple of weeks doing some uh, evaluations to see if we can find any of these individuals that we released. Um, and then we also collected some thin clips for some future genetic work. And there that's kind of kind of shows you how big they are. they're still super tiny um really small catfish and it, the, the whole the whole release and everything just went really well that day so um that's kind of where we're at now you know we're, we're we're getting to the point with CFI to where we can release some individuals back into you know some really good suitable habitat uh, we're, we're starting to look farther down the road where where could we release these individuals to you know kind of increase their footprint on the landscape um, and actually get them back into some of the areas like like in the new space and where they're they're uh, you know, on the brink of extinction if not already gone out of the noose so um, one of the areas that we're interested in is, is the upper noose um, above Falls Lake it's um, where the Eno comes in. Uh, there's Eno, the Little River, and the Flat River. The Eno River has a historical collection of Carolina Mad Times. And, um, you know, currently there's no flathead catfish, you know, above Falls Lake Dam. So it, um, you know, on the surface may, may be a good, good opportunity, a good place to release some Carolina Mad Times and get them back into the new space. And, um, before we do that, we're kind of going through a stepwise pro process right now of doing some fish community surveys, looking at what what species are there, um, specifically looking for flathead catfish and looking at the catfish community um, to see if there's any signs of uh, any of these spe uh, flathead catfish being in the system. Um, we're also doing some habitat work where we're kind of repeating a lot of the Habitat surveys um, in a similar fashion that were done a 
by the, the uh, NC State grad students in some of the areas where there's really good habitat for Carolina mad times. And we're comparing that to see, you know, are there, you know, looking at depth, looking at flow, the substrate and cover and kind of, and seeing if there's any, any habitat factors that are limiting in the upper news. Um, and also getting into looking at some of the water quality as well. So we, we've done, we worked in the flat in the Little Rivers last summer, and we'll be in the Eno River this year, and then kind of be able to make a, a really strong assessment whether this is a, you know, a viable option to release uh, Carolina Matums up into this area as well. Okay, so, you know, that's kind of where we are, where we're going. Um, you know, we're continuing our work with CFI. Um, you know, keep working with them to provide them brood stock, and they're going to keep making, uh, uh, producing Carolina Mad Times and holding on to a, a select few just kind of as an art population. We'll be looking not only in the upper news, but at other places for suitable habitat to reintroduce Carolina Mad Times in the future. And also to continue to identify and protect land within these watersheds. I, I really didn't get into that at all for this talk, um, but that's a huge component of just conserving the species. Um, luckily, the Carolina Mad Time, their habitats um, are associated with a lot of our, our um, listed and imperiled mussel species. So whenever we find really good Carolina Mad, Mad Time habitat, we typically have some several mussel species that we're interested in as well. So we we are able to highlight some of these areas and work with um, you know our agency for uh, acquiring land and working with uh, land conservancies to get you know, whether easements or um, you know acquiring the land to protect it uh, you know protecting the land around those watersheds to uh, to protect those species within them and then lastly just you know keep investigating you know alternative management techniques for flathead catfish you know our current techniques are um, not effective to control them. And so um, I think uh, we need to have some tools moving forward to where if we need to control flathead catfish in a specific watershed, then um, that's, we need to be able to identify those and, and have that if we need it. So uh, that's, that's all I have for today. Um, I'd be happy to take um, any questions anybody has. Thanks, Michael. That's great presentation. Um, again, if you have questions, if you would just put them in the chat, uh, and we'll go through those. I'm uh, not seeing any yet, so I'm gonna start you off with um, sort of a loaded question in a rabbit hole. You probably don't want to <laughs> go down too far, but um, the, your your comment about dams caught my attention. Uh, especially from the perspective of trying to control exotic invasive species. And we hear so much about dams and dam removal and even, you know, Chris, Chris Goudreau, who's on the who's on the presentation, gave a presentation about that program to the commission um, just a month or so ago. Uh, you know, so I hear about um, impediments to travel for things like uh, brook trout, but then removing dams for anadromous fish on the coast. And then you mentioned sometimes dams can be good for controlling exotic invasives. So from your perspective, how how should we go about prioritizing those kind of activities when it comes to dam removal and listed species? I think it just, you know, it definitely muddies the water. Um, it makes makes a complicated decision even more complicated i think um i think you just have to approach each dam um, individually you can't just have a kind of a one size fits all um, removal process for them you have to just sit down and look at it individually and figure out you know what are the pros and cons to removing this specific dam all right good answer anybody got any other questions So I'm going to ask one more then um, on the map you had uh, early on where you had the different species. I noticed that there was nothing shown for South Carolina. So do that. Are there no mad time species in South Carolina? There, there are mad times that that map was showing the subgenus of the rabidae. And OK, uh, 
So there are like um, the margin mad time that we have, the tadpole mad time all go down into South Carolina, and then the, the broad tail mad time down in the southeastern portion of our state, they, they go down there as well. Okay, that yeah, I just misinterpreted the map. Uh, let's see, here's a question. Uh, were the males from Contentnia Creek and Little River crossed with tar females? What's the future approach for augmenting, reintroducing to, to Contentnia Creek and Little River? So, two. yeah. Um, so we've been, you know, we, we've had been holding those two males since 2018, and we've been holding out to cross them with new females, trying to keep the basin separate. Um, we're, we're running out of time with that and the likelihood of us finding females in the in the noose are very unlikely or even finding even more males is probably unlikely um so we've we've had conversations with fish and wildlife and cfi and you know our plan moving forward is to cross those two males that we have with tar females this spring um, just so we don't lose those genetics and likely moving forward um you know if, if things continue as they are then we will have to use you know a combination of noose and tar and maybe mostly just tar individuals to repopulate uh, the new space and all right other questions from michael Well, I'm not seeing any, so I'll just say thanks again for the presentation. Uh, great work, great presentation. I appreciate everybody who uh, who uh, listened in, and I um, hope everybody has a good rest of your day, and we'll see you, see you next time. Okay, thanks for having me. Thank you.